All right, just a couple quick announcements. You know, we want to we want to thank our our lead sponsors, which were Hacker One and Fitbit. And uh, don't forget that there's a bunch of stuff going on throughout the day. Uh, there's the party tonight at eight o'clock in the DNA Lounge. There's uh, Hacker Jeopardy here in Buzzworks from six to eight p.m. Uh, the Lockpick Village. There's just a bunch of stuff, so make sure you take part in that. And now I'd like to introduce to you for this afternoon, Jen Ellis and Josh Feindlin. Guys? Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we are, whoa, loud. We are loud. That's good. Hopefully you can hear us. Um, I, yes, I did start loud, and the heckling has already begun. Goody. Um, okay, so yes, we're here to talk about uh, crisis communications, um, also known as how to survive a catastrophe. And I'm going to give you a second, guys, just to look at the picture and really appreciate the picture, which does prove you can find anything on the internet if you only search hard enough. Um, so I'm not going to bore you guys with all the stats about the fact that bad things are going to happen. You work in security probably, and so you probably already know that we are doomed. Um, so a crisis is going to come your way. You need to know about it. Uh, you need to figure out how to handle it. And typically, uh, in my experience, um, security people will focus on the technical aspects of response, which is great. Two thumbs up. You should totally do that. That's kind of your job. But uh, there is a lot more to it than that, and coming out the other side depends on how you can handle the other pieces. So the other pieces are what we're here to talk about. And I just realized, in my excitement, it didn't introduce us. Uh, so just briefly, uh, I'm Jen. I head up communications at Rapid7. This is Josh. Everybody give Josh a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. Woo! Josh heads up security at Rapid7. And you could also subtitle this talk, Josh and I's story, how we fell in love over crises. <laughs> All right, with that terrifying thought, I'm going to move on before Josh runs out of here screaming. <laughs> um, OK, so the basic gist is there are five main elements to how you deal with the communication side of a crisis. Uh, the first one is you need to make a plan. The second is that you need to manage your stakeholders. That's a really important one, and it's really hard to do, and it can make or break a situation. The third is that you need to monitor the situation. We're going to go into all of these in detail, so don't worry. This isn't it. This is like, oh, yeah, the talk's done. Bye. Um, you need to uh, arm your internal team, and then you need to inform those affected, which is the thing that everyone focuses on. So everybody focuses on that last point, and there's a lot more to it than that. So we're going to talk about why and how. So I'm going to hand over to my glamorous assistant. We started falling in love well before any crises, Jen. Uh, closer to my mouth. Wow, this is, this is interesting, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think when I first started working in the security uh, world, I remember people telling us, you need to have your incident response plan. And it was like this 80-page document that you would refer to whenever something went wrong. And I quickly figured out that it just doesn't work. Like the 80-page incident response plan doesn't work. And so I think when, when Jen and I started working together on, um, on managing crises, which you know, happened especially when, we, when I first started more often than, than I'd like to admit, it, it, was, it was disorganized at best. And what we quickly figured out is by like, doing a simple amount of planning, by thinking about things, um, and I forgot to reference the Bobcat, so I apologize, but by... by <laughs> by recognizing the winter is coming um, you, and, and planning just a little bit and socializing it with people and we'll walk through a little bit how to do that, you can make these processes go much, much better. So our hope isn't to stand up here and say, write your 80-page plan. Our hope is to give you a little bit of an idea as we go through each step uh, exactly how we do it and how you can go home and uh, try and have a little bit of an impact where you work. And so this is intentionally a scary chart. Um, our uh, this, this chart represents how Rapid7 responds to, to critical security vulnerabilities that are released in the wild. And uh, this was a very rough draft. This, I believe, was my first draft. Is that accurate? And uh, this, importantly, you guys see a bunch of letters. Uh, this follows what we, what's known as the RACI model. And it helps you figure out who's responsible for doing work, 
who's accountable for that work or the final approver for that work? Who do you need to keep in the loop, right? Who's informed uh, versus who do you need to seek feedback and advice from? And so what you realize quickly when you enter a crisis is that there's a complete lack of trust across the board. Everybody wants to get involved. Nobody knows what they're responsible for doing. Uh, and the really cool thing about this, and the reason we like using this, is when I sent this to Jen for the first time, for the people that can see me pointing, at Rapid7, we, uh, we had two separate marketing functions. We had product marketing and then marketing, and they were different organizations. And Jen owned corporate communications, public relations, and uh, many other things that aren't relevant to this story. And what we did, what I did, mistakenly, uh, was put social media, media response and a bunch of other things under our product marketing team. And we like to call this out because by spending a little bit of time taking a chart like this, I mean, it maybe took me a couple of hours to put together um, and circulating it, we were able to, before we were in a situation where we needed to be communicating with the press or writing blog posts, get ahead of who owned what. Because you can imagine what would have happened in crisis if, if a press statement would have gone out uh, and it wouldn't have gone through the person who owned press communications. And so moral of the story is find what model works for you, but just spend a couple of hours sitting down and thinking about what crises could impact your organization uh, and how you would organize your response. It doesn't have to be 80 pages long. Thank you. Um, so I would say before you get to creating this or as you go through this process, one of the great things about this is it's a forcing function for you to get to know all your team players you're gonna identify the people who are gonna be involved. And they may be, or in fact, are probably likely to be people you don't talk to every day. So, you know, Josh and I work in a security company and so unusually we know each other. But in most companies, if it's not a security company, the chances of the head of comms having much of a relationship with the head of security are pretty low. Going through a process like this means you're gonna figure out who the key players are and you're gonna build a relationship with them. And that relationship is something you need to invest in. So like go take them out for lunch, learn about who they are, learn about what they care about, what stresses them out, what are their triggers, get to know how to work with them. That's really important. And that means that when you get handed a thing like this to look at, an eye chart, and it's wrong, you're much less likely to, you know, eviscerate the person that sends it to you. So go make friends with your coworkers. Jen would never eviscerate me. She loves me too much. Uh, so another really scary diagram. Um, so when we talk about writing process flows, instead of having you know, 20 pages explaining what this is, this for us is uh, a, a guidebook. right? It, it, it's, it's not necessarily uh, a prescriptive set of things that has to happen and, and has to happen in, the, in this order. But what it does is when, when we're in the heat of the moment, we have a way that we can pull out a document to make sure we're not missing something. Uh, if we've made a mistake or something that we want to improve on in a previous crisis, we have a way of capturing it. Um, and, and I think very importantly what it does is it lets stakeholders visualize what's going to happen. Right? So again, if you send somebody an 80-page document, they're never going to read it. They might tell you they read it. They might read a few pages. If you send them a flow diagram like this, it takes them 60 seconds, 120 seconds to really look uh, look through it and, and gather an opinion. That way when something happens, hopefully they've identified a box down here where they say something like, actually this team doesn't do that, you know, my team does that. And so instead of having that conversation in the midst of crisis, uh, you can do it via email. Um, and just, just to add, so uh, not only does this help you figure out what the process should be and who's doing what, but actually it will make you much more productive. It will make you less stressed. So when Josh and I started doing um, response to a variety of different types of incidents, uh, when something happened, we would instantly create a war room. It was super disruptive. Everybody would drop what they were doing. We'd go and hustle into a little room together, uh, which was disruptive to the broader uh, team because they would see us being very suspicious. Um, and it was all very tense and like, we would sort of fight for control a little bit. We weren't in love then, you see. This was at the beginning. Um, and, and so it, it took a lot of time. Now what happens is something comes up. Josh lets me know. I trust him because I love him. Uh, and so he tells me, hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is when I'll bring you in. I know what the process is. I know he's got it. 
he, I know that he understands what I'm going to need in the situation to succeed and what we want to get to as an outcome for the organization. And so that means it doesn't disrupt my world anymore. I just carry on doing my stuff. It's like, I'm like, all right, whatever, you've got it. If you're a practitioner, right, Jen is one of these, right? And so when you think about when you're managing a crisis, everybody wants to get their hands involved. And so the more comfortable you can get people with what's happening and uh, the more comfortable you can get them with knowing they're going to get involved at the right time, your, your job is going to get much easier. Oh, manage stakeholders is me. Awesome. Uh, speaking of stakeholders, because uh, clearly I like to manage stakeholders. Um, this, this is, I think, one of the most deceptive things for people that are, um, are practitioners. Uh, the importance of keeping your stakeholders comfortable, uh, communicating with them through the process, uh, and making sure that you are uh, doing it in a calm and collected manner because your stakeholders are going to mimic your behavior is the single most important component of a response. Jen said something a little bit earlier. The monitor is messing with me. Uh, Jen said something a little bit earlier, which um, we, we, the first time we gave this talk actually kind of popped out as an underlying theme, which is take your stakeholders to lunch, right? It sounds really silly, but people get very tense, especially if they're not in crisis situations frequently. There's a biological reaction that happens with people. They get tense, they get short. And if you don't know anybody on that stakeholder uh, team, uh, you're, you're missing an opportunity because what's going to happen is if you, you know, once a quarter are getting lunch with your head of communications, your head of legal, um, whoever, whoever your relevant stakeholders are, it, the easier it's going to be for you in a time of crisis to know when they're getting snappy at you, it's not because they're dicks, it's because they're, they're under stress. And that will change your, your dynamic a ton. So we do a lot of vulnerability research, and so we disclose vulnerabilities a lot to a lot of different size and industry organizations. And um, in my experience, we'll frequently talk to the security team. The security team kind of understands what vulnerability disclosure is all about. They will work with us through the process. This is in the good situations where the security team understands what vulnerability disclosure is about, not in the myriad situations where they go, meh. Uh, so we work with the security team, they're on board, they know what the expectations are, it's all good. And we go public and the PR people who own the reputation of the company go, what the fuck just happened? And I've seen it in big organizations where that went up the chain from the head of comms to the head of business, like the CEO, and came down again onto the head of security in a really profoundly unpleasant way. And then I'm on a call going, I'm really sorry, but we told you four months ago. Um, and so don't be in that situation. Build some sense of alignment and some sense of expectation so that if you have someone come to you and say, hey, there's a problem with X, you can give forewarning to your GC or your PR people or the product people, like whoever it is, build those relationships. It won't just be the comms person. It'll be people across the organization, figure out who they are. Yeah, you're next. Monitoring. Look at that, monitoring. Okay. So monitoring, I know, right? Aren't, aren't pictures of cats great? It's what runs the internet. Um, so, monitoring the situation is the, like, deeply unsexy part of all of this. Like, yes, monitoring always sounds like it's a real action piece, real fun. Um, the reality, though, is this is critical for a number of reasons. And one of those is uh, lawsuits. Um, so, there is a reputation aspect of this where you need to know what's being said. You need to understand how to plan timing of any disclosure. You need to be aware of if people are already talking about it in the public. And so monitoring the situation, monitoring social media is extremely important from that point of view. But there's a secondary consideration whereby if there is any potential at all that you are going to face legal action, you need to be very much on top of what's happening in social media because anything that gets shared publicly can be cited in a law case. And that's a challenge, right? Because uh, we had someone who used to work for us and she had previously worked on a situation for a company, it was a document storage company, and they had a warehouse fire. And it was a really big deal, huge, huge warehouse fire. 
And when that happened, people were finding pieces of paper on the side of the road or by the river. They were taking pictures of them and putting them up on Instagram or whatever. And they weren't naming the company in the social share because they didn't know what it had come from. But nonetheless, those documents that were being photographed and put online could be used as artifacts in a law case. So her job was that she had to figure out how to monitor social for all of those things and then basically like catalog them, get them taken down, figure out what to do with them, work with the lawyers on that. So when you're working with your comms people, bear in mind that as the security experts in the room, it's your job to help them think about all of these things that they may not be aware of. My experience of working with lots and lots of comms people, a lot of them have never worked on security situations before or disaster recovery situations. And so the guidance you can give them, you don't need to be the expert on how to do the social piece, but bringing up to them the fact that this could be a consideration and that we should be watching, that's something you can do. You can help them out with that kind of thing. Is this you? Is you. It's me? I do the next two. Okay. I do the next one and then you do the two after that. Okay, we're really well prepped. It's great. We're great. Um, Thundercats, ho! Yeah. Karen, yeah, you. You and me. Um, yeah, so uh, here's the thing. People always focus on external communications. And that's really important and we're going to get to that. But your internal team are the people that are in the trenches. They're the people who are going to get questions. They're the most invested in what's happening, and they are going to freak out. And if you're doing that thing that I talked about earlier, where you're kind of going off into rooms and having very stressed-looking private conversations, your team is not stupid. They're going to notice that shit, and they're going to be like, oh, something's happened. And they're going to assume that the world is coming to an end. And then they'll start speculating and gossiping. This is bad news. So firstly, you have to think about how you're presenting yourself to that team and you have to you know, do the duck thing of, of gliding on the surface and paddling like hell underneath. The second thing is you have to think very carefully about when you're going to disclose to the internal team and how. Bear in mind once you disclose internally to the broad team like all of your colleagues, that is now public. You cannot trust those people to keep it private, it won't happen, it is now public. So you have to make your timing very carefully measured and you have to think about what to share with them. If you share information before you've nailed the facts, you will probably cause confusion. That will come back and bite you on the ass. We've had that problem ourselves. Um, if you share what happened but you don't prepare them to get questions, then that's going to be difficult because their customers are going to be phoning them, they're not going to know how to deal with it and they're just going to be saying things on the phone in the heat of the moment. So uh, this is where an FAQ is your best friend. And you want to think about what are all the worst questions you're going to get. And really push yourselves to like, think about those nasty questions. When we write these things, frequently people get offended by the questions that I put in. And I'm always like, it's, this isn't coming from me. This is what other people are going to ask us. And we need to be prepared with an answer. Like, Hopefully we don't get asked it. Be prepared and work really closely with your general counsel and your comms people to help them figure out how to answer it. Again, they are the experts in law and communications, but you're the experts in security, so help them, help them navigate this. So finally, the bit that most people care about, which is the external communication. There are a number of, uh, of elements to this. People tend to focus on press because that's the really scary thing. Um, the first step on this, though, is what are your legal requirements for notification? Uh, there are 47 different state laws around breach notification. Your legal team needs to be familiar with them and understand what the expectations are. If you handle incident response in your organization, you should also be familiar with them and know what the expectations are. That's the first thing. You have to think about how you're going to notify those affected. Then you can start thinking about what that means in terms of press and partners and social media and all those other pieces. And again, timing here is critical. If you go too quickly, you will do more harm than good and you'll create confusion and panic. We had a situation where we didn't create confusion and panic, but it was still suboptimal. Um, our uh, DNS host was hacked. This is going back a few years ago. And when we were doing the investigation, we got some information that indicated the hack may have happened via fax. And people kind of thought that was funny and cool. And so we tweeted it. 
uh, I think something like hacking like it's 1969 was the tweet. Um, and then as we went further, we found out actually like faxes weren't involved and it was much more mundane how they'd done it. And, um, and then we couldn't take it back. Like we'd put that information out there and in this situation, no harm was done. But the reality is we put out information that's just plain inaccurate and we could have done a much better job to have waited and put something out that was right. Now, your comms team is gonna feel a lot of pressure because they're gonna have reporters, I'm staring at an evil reporter right now, they're gonna have reporters beating down their door trying to get a comment and they're gonna be writing articles. Like, they're not gonna wait, they'll go write the article and it'll all be speculation and we all know that there'll be lots of people in the community tweeting and speculating and blogging and offering comment and that's hard to deal with. It's hard to stay firm and you need to work with your comms team and your legal team to figure out what you can say in that situation and what you can't and what the right timing is. And I unfortunately cannot tell you, oh, the timing is three days or the timing is three hours. It depends entirely on the situation and you have to help them read the situation to figure that piece out. The one last thing I'll say on the public aspect is just bear in mind that there are lots of different medium that you need to use. It's not gonna just be press. It's not just gonna be social. You might blog. You might need to think about, are people going crazy on Reddit? I mean, there's all sorts of different things that you'll need to think about. Is there a, a conference coming up and you need your booth staff to be prepped? So you need to think about all of those different elements. And again, your comms team should be thinking about this, but you can help them navigate this. So you can, you can probably tell there's a little bit of a mix of broader crisis management and security response to, uh, to anything you face there. And I think one of the things that we run into all the time, both as a service provider and a service consumer, uh, is that there will be situations in which we notify people that there's been an issue with their data and we're also being notified that there's an issue with our data. Uh, so it's definitely cyclical. One of the most important things that anybody can do in this situation is be authentic. Uh, too frequently there is pressure um, if you're getting on the phone with a customer to try and you know, soften the language or, or to do something to obfuscate the truth, right? Maybe, maybe if we change these words, as long as they don't ask a follow-up question, the damage will be, uh, the damage will be much smaller. And uh, I think in our experience, at least, what we've noticed is when we're interacting with people and we're disclosing, you kind of, they, they kind of fall into two camps. One is, unless it's a real substantive issue, they're going to go, oh, thanks for telling us. Like, we appreciate the transparency. Uh, and the other camp is you're going to have a group of people that are um, going to use this as a fire drill, right? They're going to get worked up about it. No, no, really, like the fact that we just lost your IP addresses with no other context doesn't pose a lot of risk. It's not acceptable, but... So if you can start with a degree of authenticity and make all of those stakeholders really understand what happened, what you did to fix it, uh, you're, going to, you're going to make the process much, much easier. Because as soon as, and, and this is for me too, as soon as, as soon as I'm dealing with a service provider and I can start to, to tell that they're wording things, they're trying to be a little uh, skittish around what they're saying, like I'm going to go right to that thing they don't want me to ask. And the worst situation you're going to be in is, when you're on the phone with a customer and you're trying to work around something that's a little embarrassing and then they ask a question that you just can't lie about and you respond and it's embarrassing and then it ends up on social media. That's gonna be a lot more harmful for you than when they're like, wow, like company X just told me this and you know that sucks but they handled it really well, I appreciate it. Much maybe like the last pass breach was I think one of the more recent examples I can think of. Authenticity is really incredibly important. And, I, and on top of that, as security practitioners, you need to make sure that you represent that when you're working with your comms and your legal people. It's very, very easy for people that haven't worked in our industry to miss out on a lot of the subcultures that exist in our industry. Uh, so you have to represent that to them because if they don't know how that works, and it can go back to some of the points Jen was making on the last slide, um, it can cause a lot more harm to your company's reputation than, than otherwise would have occurred. So on top of that, it was funny, when we first had this slide, we talked, we, we talked a little bit about how we had to reassure the affected. 
And then we paused and we said, well, reassuring can certainly be condescending sometimes because if you've just lost like, you know, a million patient records, you probably don't want to be reassuring them that everything's going to be okay. It, it, this, I think this ties back to authenticity in that if your focus is helping them be successful, right? Not worrying about your own self-interest, but helping, helping the affected individuals of that crisis be successful, your whole response is going to go much smoother. Right? And you'll see it. If you're ever in a situation, you'll absolutely see when you're in the scenario and, you have, uh, and you're trying to have a conversation where you're not being truly genuine, uh, it takes a lot longer to prepare, prepare for. It's a lot less smooth. But when you are focused on helping the people that are impacted and you're being authentic, it actually makes the whole process dramatically easier. Um, so I feel like this, this cat is my spirit animal. Um, but I... I, just one thing I wanted to clarify is, you know, we talked about the importance of authenticity and, and part of that is accuracy. But don't confuse accuracy for the need to share every little detail. Oversharing is one of the worst things you can do. It will freak people right out. The number of people you talk to who have the level of knowledge that you have about security, probably going to be low. If you are talking to another security team, that's a different situation. Then they're going to ask questions. They're going to want to have detailed answers. But if you're talking to consumers and you overshare, you're going to terrify them. The things to focus on when you are taking an approach that is centered around those affected is what is the effect on them and what action do they need to take to remediate? Those are the two questions to ask yourself constantly. That's what you should communicate first and foremost every single time. Make it easy for them. Okay, so we went through a bunch of stuff in a not very long period of time, so I'm gonna quickly go back to what the five key learnings are across those five areas of activity that we talked about. So the first thing is, you have to prepare well, go make friends, figure out who does this in your organization, fall in love. Um, the second and I wish this wasn't true because there's no hard and fast on how to do this, but timing is everything. Go too late and you're doomed. The media story will get away from you. You'll look like you don't care and you're unresponsive. Go too early and you won't have your information nailed and people will get confused and they'll panic. Don't be overconfident. Don't go out and tell people it was a fax when it wasn't a fax. You'll just end up with egg on your face in the best scenario and a lawsuit in the worst. Um, Expect that you're going to get difficult questions. Prepare for them. Arm your internal team on how to answer them, whether it's the entire organization or just your key stakeholders. And as usual for the last is always, always, always let your guiding principle be what is the best thing for those affected. Let that be your compass. Thank you very much. We've been Josh and Jen. You can take a bow if you want, yeah. <laughs> Josh and Jen, thanks very much. You know, our friends at Fitbit would want to thank you guys too. So here's a gift for you guys as speakers from Fitbit. There you go. <laughs>